Commissioner Olenek. Reporting John Olenek, Caltrans District 5. We can't hear you. John Olenek, Caltrans District 5. Can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> thank there. you. Okay. Commissioner Peterson. Here. <laughs> Peterson. Peterson. Oh, Peterson. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I heard you're like, from. I'm sorry. It's, a, it's an identity crisis, you know? I guess it's early in the morning. You had different voice. One of many. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Here. Commissioner Cummings. Okay. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commissioner Kiddos Carter. Commissioner Rotkin. And Commissioner Hernandez. Did I already call you? Yeah, you did. Here, okay. again. Hey, and I see Commissioner Peterson is Here. joining us now. Do we have any AB 2449 just cause requests? Anyone online? Okay. And uh, Executive Director Preston, do we have any changes or additions, deletions to the agenda today? Uh, no changes to the agenda. We have a few things posted to our website. We have the presentations for items 18 and 19, as well as a handout for item 19. Great, thank you. We'll now proceed with oral communications. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communication, but in compliance with state law, it may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly so that it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. Is there anyone here in chambers that wishes to address the commission? <laughs> all right, seeing none, is there anyone online? I do not see any hands raised. Okay. Then we'll proceed with the consent agenda. Any commissioner have any comments or questions on the consent agenda? Seeing none, any member of the public wish to comment on the consent agenda? You know what I hear in chambers? Is there anyone online? There is no one online. Right. Do I have a motion? The consent agenda. Second. Motion from Commissioner Schifrin, second from Commissioner Brown to adopt the consent agenda. Any, and there, any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> that passes unanimously by all commissioners present. All right, we will proceed with item 15, commissioner reports. Any commissioner? Uh, yes, Commissioner Montesino. Yes, I'd just like to report to committee and staff that um, as we looked at the next uh, year schedules, our, our, our Watsonville chambers are going to be capable of of doing uh, the Zoom and virtual uh, virtual components. So we're over here back to doing that uh, meetings in Watsonville. Fantastic. Looking forward to coming down and seeing your lovely chambers down there. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, just um, several of us are uh, members of Metro as well, and uh, Metro is just ch is going to change as of December its route structure, and it's going to be uh, we're going to get there more often, uh, and uh, within the fifteen minute time frame in a lot of places, it's going to be different. Uh, we think the signage and everything is going to be appropriate is going to be sufficient to let people know uh, which routes are going where. Uh, there's going to be some changes, but I think it's. I feel very confident it's going to be a very uh, uh, better system for the, and serving more people for, in the metro. And I want to thank all those who are members of Metro, and especially uh, especially our CEO Michael Tree for putting this forward with uh, John Ergo and some others. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Yes, we're definitely on our way to a world-class metro system. Very exciting. All right. Um, then if there's no other commissioner reports, we'll move to the director's report. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Koenig and commissioners. Um, I have uh, two staffing announcements and a few other items to discuss today. Um, first, one of our transportation planners has been approved for a master's degree in city resiliency. Uh, Amanda Marino, uh, who has been a transportation planner uh, for the RTC for the last three and a half years has been accepted to a master's degree program in city resiliency at the International University of Catalonia in Barcelona, Spain. Amanda plans to use that education to enhance her skills in the area of climate resiliency um, and the challenges in transportation. 
Amanda's proposal is to take one year off from her current position to complete this master's degree, and uh, staff has approved that uh, request. Uh, to mitigate the impacts on uh, planning work, RTC is recruiting for a temporary planner position for one year. While attending the program, Amanda will uh, work remotely for a few hours per week to help with her traffic demand management assignments. Uh, Amanda's increased education on climate resiliency will help prepare her uh, to serve and benefit the Santa Cruz County community in a growing area of our work moving forward. Congratulations to Amanda. Although I can't say I look forward to her leaving, we will be happy to have her return with new skills and, pers and perspectives on uh, how climate affects our work. Um, we are also um, just welcomed um, a new planning intern, Anna um, Kloffoff. Um, uh, Anna was is originally from Michigan and earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Public and Nonprofit Administration from Grand Valley State University. And she is currently pursuing a Master's of Urban Planning at San Jose State University. Uh, Anna will work primarily with senior planner Rachel Morcone, um on the preparation of RTC's Transportation Equity Action Plan, which is just getting started with funds secured from last year's Caltrans planning grants. Um, I have an announcement regarding uh, emergency storm damage work. Um, you might remember at last month's RTC meeting, the commission authorized the rejection of the single bid we received on the phase two debris removal contract associated with storm damage on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. The rejected bid was 54% over the engineer's estimate. Staff recommended addressing one critical location, a bridge at milepost 8.32 as a standalone project uh, to complete the work prior to the onset of winter rains. Due to the potential for migrating listed and special species uh, during the rainy season, all work must be completed uh, prior to October 15th of this year and under the direction of RTC's on-call biology monitoring consultant. Uh, staff solicited uh, two bids with the lowest bid received from industrial railways for 192,800, which was within 5% of the engineer's estimate. So that was a good decision. Uh, on September 18th, I discussed the bids with Chair Koenig and he concurred with an award of a contract to industrial railways. A contract was subsequently executed and industrial railways commenced the work uh, this past Monday, October 2nd and work is anticipated to take uh, about seven to 10 days. So we will get the work done before um, environmental deadlines. For the remaining 24 phase two debris removal sites, RTC staff assessed that they, they do not pose an immediate threat um, to the integrity of the line. Uh, since the timing and the work windows of the prior two solicitations were significant factors in resulting in the high bids, RTC staff plans to rescope and re-advertise at a later date, uh, we believe uh, the changes uh, sh should result in more competition and better bids. Uh, this will also give uh, more time for project formulations to be completed by FEMA, uh, which would give RTC reasonable assurance that the work would be reimbursable from state and federal uh, assistance programs. RTC staff will monitor these remaining sites as well as the already completed storm damage repair sites in advance and during the winter rainy, rainy season to monitor site conditions and to take any action as may become necessary. And then I'm gonna uh, state a little bit more about what uh, Commissioner uh, McPherson stated re regarding Metro. Um, five of you are uh, also our uh, Metro board members and were part of two significant actions that took place on September 22nd when the Metro board authorized the purchase of 57 fuel cell electric buses and what was referred to as phase one of their reimagined Metro program. The purchase of the buses is the largest procurement of hydrogen cell electric buses in the nation and puts Metro in an excellent position of meeting the California Air Resource Board's goal of fully transitioning all bus fleets in the state to zero emission by 2040. This purchase was made possible in part by three significant grants received by Metro, one from the state and two from the federal government. In addition to converting fleet to zero emissions, Metro adopted a proposal to implement what is being referred to as phase one service of the reimagined Metro program. 
The reimagined Metro program was developed to help Metro increase ridership with a goal of doubling that ridership. To help meet this goal, Metro staff proposed service changes in, to be implemented in phases. So phase one increases service level by 10%. It increases frequency in areas with higher demand, provides simpler and more direct routes, creates better transfers for shorter wait times, and does not require a second fare when you transfer. Phase one will change route numbers and in some cases change the streets, which have bus service and part of that is related to the, um, the, the upcoming work by the city on the Murray Street Bridge. Um, with the board of approval, Metro will implement phase one in December of this year and that's a very ambitious schedule. So Metro is in the process of implementing a comprehensive outreach program as referred to by Commissioner McPherson to notify the public of, of these phase one changes. If you are an existing rider of Metro, please pay attention as there will be changes that will impact you, but likely in a very positive manner. But of course you need to be at the right station and looking for the right route. But if you are not a current Metro user, please consider evaluating whether these changes might make Metro a more attractive option for you. As you might be aware, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation is one of the leading causes of global warming. And the public does have an option to help make a positive change one ride at a time. Metro is also considering subsequent changes referred to as phases two and three, which I understand are still under development. Those phases will further increase service, frequency, and change routes. However, implementation for future phases will be subject to additional public outreach, planning, and subsequent action by the Metro board. Those phases are dependent on the availability of funding, but Metro plans to seek those funds so the full build out can be achieved. There is a lot of exciting improvements happening at our transit district. Um, Metro General Manager Mike Tree and I met on Tuesday, and as always, I was amazed by how he uses his vision and strategic thinking to advance regional goals. I'm sure there will be more to follow, and RTC will need to continue to show its support in reimagining Metro to better serve our community. And that concludes my director's report. Thank you, Director Preston. Are there questions from commissioners? Seeing none, any members of the public wish to comment on the executive director's report? Anyone here in chambers? Is there anyone online? There is not. All right, then. Thank you very much, Director Preston. We'll now proceed uh, with the Caltrans report by alternate director Olenek. I think that right? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, John Elaine, Caltrans District 5, here on behalf of Scott Eads, our district director. Uh, just a few brief comments, a little follow up from a few things from last month as well, as Director Preston mentioned. Uh, last month, we were able to celebrate the award of a handful of sustainable transportation planning grants to Santa Cruz County. Uh, and really, that was exciting. We do very well in District 5 uh, with getting uh, grants uh, for planning efforts for transportation. But I was here today to also announce that the next grant season has come upon us. So uh, the 24 fiscal year 24-25 grant season has opened, uh, and we will be holding a district workshop, a virtual workshop, on October 12th from 1.30 to 3. And uh, the flyer is in the news. Uh, we, we, have, we have some flyers available we can provide to staff and pass out whoever is needed. And so uh, it's a, another chance for another round of grants. We're excited for the ones we have, and we're going to work hard and diligent with you on those. Uh, but looking ahead for the next year. So that is coming up too. Another item I was going to mention uh, last month, I got to touch a little on some of the closures and the construction and uh, restoration projects happening from the winter storms uh, in the San Lorenzo Valley area. I got a chance to chat with Commissioner McPherson a few times about it. But uh, just as an update, since our last time we've talked, High two, Highway 236 was able to reopen to one way reversible traffic uh, not long ago. Construction for that is is, is anticipated to be completed by Thanksgiving. Along Highway 9 uh, at Jay's Wall, that, that area, we were performing night work to accommodate the daytime traffic needs, but we're going to have to shift to day, to day work to accommodate that uh, work to get done efficiently. However, there is going to be one-way reversal traffic. It won't be closed, and we'll make accommodations for people who need to get through. And again, uh, <clears throat> construction is anticipated for that to be done somewhere around mid-December. Another construction item uh, a full closure has begun. Hopefully you all saw the press release or saw it through our social media uh, accounts, our handles. Uh, but a full closure has begun on Highway 35, where it overlaps with Bear Creek Road. 
um, access between 17, Highway 17 and San Lorenzo Valley is not possible at this time because of the work being done, the geographic challenges, the construction staging, things like that. But there, uh, we have our changeable message signs up and we're doing our best to get the word out to the traveling public. Uh, that that work we hope will be done by the end of January. And also, it's just, again, you know, in addition to cleaning up storms from last year, we're also beginning our work for winter preparations for this year. So uh, you'll see some activity along uh, the San Lorenzo Valley Corridor, really probably many areas uh, of San, Santa Cruz County as that work gets done. So we just really appreciate everyone's patience, uh, encourage folks to check in with um, our social media. We have our Caltrans Quick Map app uh, that everyone can download to, to their phones. It's a, it's a, of course a Google map based, but it gives some very good real time information on what's happening, where, what construction is happening, what change of message signs might be on. Uh, and so just as a reminder for everyone that's available and uh, we're, we're, we'll do our best to keep informing you and your staff and the public as things change. And it is obviously, as you can appreciate, very dynamic. So thank you for your attention. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, from uh, the commissioners or the audience. Thank you, Alternate Commissioner Olenek. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? I say thank you, Chair. Again, I just want to thank uh, Caltrans and Mr. Olenek uh, that several discussions on this. Some huge issues and problems up in the valley from, from previous storms, and there are elsewhere in the county too, but they're uh, very significant in San Jose Valley. And I want to thank him and the Caltrans Crans uh, True for cooperating with our county and uh, seeing how we can get to this as quickly as possible uh, without interrupting the travel uh, modes of uh, many people in the San Jose Valley. So thank you again, Caltrans, much appreciated. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Comments or questions from commissioners? Uh, let the record show that Commissioner Quinn has joined us at uh, approximately 9.18. Um, any comments from members of the public? You know, one here in chambers, is there anyone online? We don't have anyone online. All right, then. Thank you again, Mr. Olenek. We will now proceed with a presentation on transportation projects in Santa Cruz County. And I want to welcome up Assistant Director of Public Works, Steve Wiesner. Good to see you, Steve. Here. Yeah. Hopefully you know how to use these mics by now. Yeah, I hope so too as well. Um, <laughs> well, it's great to be here this morning. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners and Director Preston, RTC staff and members of the public. Uh, my name is Steve Wiesner. I'm uh, Assistant Director of Public Works with the county. And with me today, I have Casey Carlson. Uh, he is our Senior uh, Operations Engineer in charge of all of our pavement management projects throughout the county. Um, and so today uh, we have for you an update on transportation related projects uh, within the unincorporated area of our county. Uh, the last update, we do this every two or three years. The last update was I think March 21. So I have a fair amount to share with you this morning. I'll try to go quickly. Um, but I'd like to start by congratulating Director Preston on his upcoming retirement, um, his partnership, and also thanking him and his staff for his partnership um, throughout his tenure here. Uh, in delivering critical projects uh, for our county and all the all the local jurisdictions in our region. We can't thank Guy enough. Um, he's done great work. His staff has done great work. We hope to continue that legacy uh, moving forward. Thank you, Guy. Um, the focus of our presentation today um, is going to be mostly on projects um, that have been funded wholly uh, or in part through your commission. It's going to consist of a Measure D update, uh, recently com completed projects, uh, projects that are currently in construction, um, projects that are under development, and we'll touch a little bit on the future needs of our transportation network. Um, hopefully, there'll be a little time for Q&A at the end as well. Okay, so just a reminder um, for all of us here, uh, members of the public, um, Measure D, critical measure that was passed by the voters of our county in November 2016. Um, the, the county receives, you can see the pie chart there, um, the 30% for neighborhood and street projects. The county receives approximately about half of that. Um, and currently it's around 3.8 million per year. And, um, and we've delivered a project every single year since we started receiving money in 2018. Um, and we've been able to resurface, you know, over 40 miles of county roads uh, since then. And, um, and, you know, it's a probably over $20 million worth of investment um, that, that the taxpayers have made in the county's road system. So we're very grateful for that. 
we have a lot of lot to show just so i'm going to run through these fairly quickly um in 2018 the first project we delivered um, we were able to do some work um, up off of socal san jose in the summit area down in the la selva beach area um out in the bonnie dune area of our county um we we repaired a critical bridge down in the South County area in Casserly. Um, and we started doing some resurfacing work in downtown Boulder Creek. And I will say our approach has been as much as possible to spread this money uh, throughout the region. We're responsible for 600 miles of roadway throughout the entire unincorporated area of our county. So in 2019, um, we delivered a project in the Live Oak area. Uh, we did some work down in the Rio Del Mar Beach Flats. Um, again, we were up in Bonnie Dune area doing Martin Road. And we began work down in the ben, uh, downtown Ben Loman area. 2020, we started delivering uh, resurfacing projects up in the Thurber area, um, and we started working down in the beach area, Sea Cliff area, uh, and then we started working on Lakeview Road. We did half of Lakeview Road that year uh, down in the Watsonville area, um, and then we started in downtown Felton. So you can start to see the pattern here as we're spreading. We're we're, we're trying to do is work on the most dense. Uh, downtown areas and neighborhood areas that are the most traveled and we're sort of working our way out and we just kind of sort of spreading the work throughout the county as every every year comes comes forward and let's see and my clicker has stopped working so maybe you can advance the next slide that'd be great okay oh there we go now in 2021 uh we began we began some work up uh this is the merlin way streets area that's blue ball park energy cummings uh we did some work down in coralitos we finished up lakeview road that year the second half and then we started working again in boulder creek kind of working our way out from the downtown area in 2022 uh, we continued on thurber we did a very significant project on on portola um in the pleasure point area uh, and again, we revisited Rio Del, Mar, Rio Del Mar. We did a, quite a bit of work in the Soquel Village area and um, and then found us back in Ben Lomond doing more work spreading out from the downtown area. And we're very busy this past summer. This is a, uh, part of the pavement management project that the county has going on this summer. And you can see all the roads that we worked on there uh, in the Pleasure Point area, um, Sea Cliff area again, uh, Ocean View area, which is kind of just sort of south of La Selva. Um, and we were starting to do a lot of work down in South County, uh, resurfacing all the Green Valley Road, uh, part of Paulson, um, and then back up in the downtown Felton area, um, and a little bit of work, Ocean Street Extension, and then we did all of Quail Hollow Road, which is quite critical. We had a lot of problems with that road this last winter, um, and there's a large pipeline project, actually, that the San Lorenzo Valley Water District recently did, so we came in on the heels of that. Um, okay, uh, so this is one project that we're actually hoping to be in construction on right now. Um, it's a Green Valley multi-use path project. This is a two-mile uh, pedestrian and bicycle path separated from the roadway. Um, we've got a design. We've got a plan. We won a $5 million Clean California's grant a couple of years ago. Uh, we we put this project together very quickly. We put it out to bid. We have a little bit of Measure D money. You can see that, that our uh, the Board of Supervisors approved on this project. However, bids came in at, uh, about two and a half million dollars over the engineer's estimate. And so we are actually looking for more funding for this project. We have a very tight deadline on this project by the state. We're able to get extended six months, but if we're not able to find the gap in funding between now and I would say like this next June, uh, we run the risk of having to give that $5 million back. And of course, we do not want to do that. And this is a really fantastic project. Um, so we're going to continue to seek funding for that. And we're very hopeful that we'll be able to deliver this project next year. Um, and then what we have proposed for next year in 24. So it's kind of nice to have a little visual here of the county. And you can kind of see how we're spreading the work out again in the unincorporated area. Um, and so next year, you know, we anticipate delivering projects up in Felton and, and the Scotts Valley area that are unincorporated. A um, little bit of work down in Aptos around Chop Gulch. Um, and um, and hopefully the rail trail segment eight and nine, uh, we have a significant investment of the Measure D funds of local neighborhood Measure D funds going towards that project as well in partnership with the city. The city of Santa Cruz, I should say. Um, okay, uh, completed project since our last RTC update. Um, Again, we're really focused on pavement management. I will say, by and large, the funds that come through the commission have become our pavement management program for our arterials and collector roadways. These are the big road roads in our county, the ones that carry the most traffic, 10, 15,000 plus cars a day. Um, so uh, in 2020, I, we were in construction last time I reported to you, but this project was completed shortly after that. Um, and you can see we were able to do a lot of work, uh, you know, in the 
Glen Arbor area. This is up in Ben Lomond. A lot of the roads that are adjacent to Highway 17 and alternate routes to Highway 17 um, and a little bit of work up in some of the you know more rural areas like Zayani and then Empire Grade. And these are all roads like Zayani, Empire Grade that connect our communities together and provide critical evacuation routes actually for folks that live up in the mountains. Um, and then we are able to completely rebuild all of Pioneer and Varney down in the Coralitos area. So I know really important to South County, those roads, roads have been neglected for years to come. And what I want you to focus in on here is look how much money your commission is, give, is, is providing for these projects. And that RSTP, that's tip money, that's almost $7 million worth, worth of funding. These projects don't happen without your commission. So we're here to say thank you and to continue delivering these projects. Sometimes it works and sometimes it does. Okay. And also, since I last reported, um, we completed the second phase of the Aptos Village Plan, uh, which is basically a signalized intersection at Aptos Creek Road. Um, so we had removed the last uh, stop sign uh, the year before that, phase one, which was at Trout, Trout Coast. So we only actually have one stop sign left on Soquel Drive. And keep in mind, Soquel Drive is kind of like our highway too, right? So that's at Robertson, right? So we're very keen on trying to get that 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 signalized as well um but we've just about completed all the work in the village um with the phase one and phase two okay i'm going to touch a little bit on project construction i mentioned this one just earlier um in the the measure d segment um but we put out a very robust uh pavement management project this this summer uh which included all the funding sources you see there um, and again, you can take a look at the critical funding that your commission provides um, in RSTP and in STIP funding, um, and then look at the Measure D funding that came from our local streets and roads program as well, um, with a significant you know match coming coming from the local road program. And so with this, we're able to deliver quite a bit of um, resurfacing on San Andreas, Olahan Road, Airport Boulevard, Green Valley Road, and uh, and we're starting to rehabilitate Buena Vista Drive. Um, uh, in front of the landfill there. So we're going to continue that work and we're able to get a small segment of it done this summer. Okay, another great project that, we, that we've completed this summer, uh, which we're calling the Emergency Routes Project, which is basically resurfacing all of Alba, Jameson, and Jameson Creek Roads um, and, a part, and a portion of Empire Grade. Um, all of these roads were smack dab in the middle of the CZU fire and they were heavily impacted by the debris removal operations and um, emergency service delivery up there, firefighting and so forth. Um, and these roads really needed it, needed it really badly. So we're really happy to be able to bring this one. Um, you can see Casey's team has been really busy delivering these pavement management projects. Uh, and again, most of this funding came through your commission. Okay, so um, this is this is probably the single biggest project that the Raw Road Department has undertaken in, in many decades, if ever. Um, it's, it's a $25 million plus project. Uh, we're in construction, and this is, a, this is a great partnership project between us and the RTC. So again, we thank the RTC for their partnership here. Um, while, while Caltrans and the RTC are busy doing work on Highway 1, uh, we're out there on Soquel Drive. This is a five and a half mile project. It goes all the way from the Santa Cruz City limits to uh, State Park Drive. And then there's a lot of really good elements in this project. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really transform the way SoCal Drive looks and the way it's used. Um, we're providing a lot more safety for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, and we're upgrading all of the signals. I think it's like 22 signals involved um, with modern detection systems and also bus priority. So we'll work with Metro on this as well. Um, so we're really hoping this like aids in Metro's 15-minute headway goals for SoCal Drive. Um, and uh, we're happy to be in construction on this one. So it's just going and it's going to be, you know, probably about a year and a half of construction. Another project that's been like in design for a long time. Actually, I was just talking with my staff the other day. I did, did the original layout on this project in 1999. So it took a long time to deliver this one for South County, but we did. We got a bid out. We got it awarded. Um, and we're actually, uh, we have a little bit of a supply chain issue with some of the, the poles and signal equipment. So we think construction is going to start next spring, um, but, but we're going on it. And we know there's a lot of other work going on in that area. So in some ways the delay is good because um, because of all the other work in the area. Um, so we're excited to get this one finally built um, and improved. Um, there's a lot of schools in this area and it's going to involve a lot of bicycle and pedestrian safety as well. Okay. Um, Projects under development. So this is kind of interesting. We all literally only have one project under development. I think what this what this simplifies and and is a good example of when we get the money, we spend it. 
You know, we've been we've been spending the money that has been awarded to the county almost as quickly as we've been getting it. And the only reason this project is still in development is because we're waiting for the availability of SIP funds. I think it's programmed out what, like two years now, twenty five. I think yeah, twenty five. So we'll deliver that project in twenty five when the SIP you know the SIP programming becomes real. Um, and this is literally the only project we have under development that uh, your commission has funded. Okay, so with that, I'm just going to touch on a couple other things just to give you a little bit of context. Um, not only are we working on all our pavement management and all these improvement projects, but um, as your commission knows, we've been we've been hit by a series of storms over the last many years. Um, this year, we it was pretty bad. Um, we're busy. Our team's out there. I've got, I think we've completed like 40 repairs so far, and I have another 30 that are in construction today. And these are storm damage repairs, mostly to our mountainous roads. Um, and you can see this year, uh, we estimate, you know, about $140 million worth of damage, 200 plus sites. So, um, and it's sort of almost a mini repeat of what we had in 2017, right? We got hit really, really hard in 2017. We didn't have quite the flooding in 2017 that we had this past season, um, but roads got hit really, really hard in 2017. Um, we're getting close to being done with all those projects, but you can see as these layer up, as we have to grapple with climate change and more intense storm systems, uh, our mountainous region really takes a, takes a hard hit, and, but we're busy doing this work uh, in conjunction with everything else we have going on. Um, okay, just going to touch a little bit on our future needs here. Um, it's probably no surprise that we're going to continue uh, aggressively pursuing storm damage repairs and as much pavement management as we can possibly do. Um, keeping in mind, and what's nice is, is that when we do pavement management projects, it gives us a new clean canvas to paint new lines on the road and start installing modern standards like green bike lanes and um, trying to make more room for pedestrians and all of these types of things. And so with pavement management comes a lot of other benefits. Um, and the types of safety projects that we're really looking at doing are active transportation projects so we can really improve our bicycle and pedestrian uh, network. Um, the last few years, we've completed both our active transportation plan and also a complete streets plan around around schools. These are both for uh, with Caltrans planning grants, um, which is great because it gives us a whole smattering of projects. Now we can start to aggressively pursue grants for, and we're going to do that. Um, and it's you know all in the name of uh, multimodal and uh, you know trying to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint as well. Um, and and with that, we're still busy actually on our bridge and culvert replacement programs. I say we. Uh, the county has about 150 bridges it's responsible for in the unincorporated area. Um, I, we have 12 actively in design right now for full replacements. Um, and the other thing we're doing is we're in the middle of a, a fairly robust culvert assessment right now to look at, we have thousands of culverts out there, literally five to 6,000 culverts all over the unincorporated area. A lot of these installed between 50 and 80 years ago. They're all reaching the end of their service life. Um, you can see that photo there, sort of an example of, a rotted out culvert. And we have a lot of these that look like this. Uh, so we're, we're busy uh, assessing them and we're going to be producing a report this year and bringing it to our board uh, to let them know kind of what sort of the impact of all this is and what our plan is to try and keep up with, uh, with the failure of these culverts. Um, and, and like I mentioned earlier on Soquel Drive, we're going to continue to work on our signal, signal operational improvements and try to work closely with Metro on that too. So it meets their goals as well. Okay, I, the last two slides I have here, just kind of just to sort of remind everybody um, how bad our roads actually are. And with all this great work we're doing, we still have a lot of needs out there. Uh, we reported to our board of supervisors in 2018. We do a, pay, a pavement survey about every five years. We we relook at our the 600 miles, and we kind of do a little state of the pavement, if you will. Um, and you know, PCI's pavement condition index. You know, brand new roads 100, totally failed road is zero. We reported back in 2018 that our average PCI was 48 and that we were going to need somewhere north of 20 million a year just in pavement management just to keep our PCI even. Um, well, we certainly haven't gotten that. At the time, we estimated we'd be receiving and be able to invest somewhere around $8 million a year. With that $8 million a year, we still fully expected our PCI to drop. And you can see that uh, on, this, uh, on this graph. We really only got about five to six million a year. Um, and we're actively, you know, putting that that work out on the street just about as fast as we can bring the funds in. Um, and this next slide really just gives you a visual of our county. Um, and this was uh, every year or two, um, the state of California gets together um, and all the agencies report their, their PCI. And so we gathered this data from the 2021 Local Streets and Roads Report. 
And you, you can kind of see, I mean, this really, I think the pie charts on the right really tell a good story, right? Um, in the unincorporated area of our county, we've got about 50% of the population, but the county has about 70% of the, of the lane miles. So we, we have the bulk of the roads, the public roads. Um, and so obviously, you know, we think it's really important to invest in our roads, right? It's, it's how we, it's how we all get around. Um, and so we want to continue, we're going to continue to advocate as strongly as we possibly can for funding to keep our roads in good shape. And so with that, so you can click the last slide there. Um, you know, we want to thank you for, for your support. Um, but first I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank my staff um, who really put these projects out. So Casey does all the pavement management. Um, I've got Russell Chen, who's our traffic engineer. He's working on all the signal and the bike and, and head safety improvements. Tim Bailey, senior civil engineer in charge of all of our storm damage and bridge projects. Um, and then of course, Matt Machado knows here, back here. Um, the county's uh, director of community development and infrastructure. He provides critical experience and guidance on all of our projects. He's instrumental in our part on our partnership with your commission. Um, and, um, and he's very involved with everything we do. Um, and, and of course, Director Preston and his staff, especially Rachel Morricone, and um, now Amy uh, Naranjo has been helping us out quite a bit um, with providing our local agencies with uh, accurate and up-to-date funding information and really keeping us like up-to-date on the current state and federal transportation legislation that's coming through. And, um, and again, I just really like to thank your commission for um, caring about our transportation system and continuing to focus in on the needs of our county. Um, and so with that, we'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Assistant Director Reiser. Questions from the commission? I uh, ask Mr. Johnson. That on? Thank you for that. Um, pretty impressive. So when you say advocate for funds, where do you expect that money to come from? Well, a lot of it comes right through your commission. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, on a biannual basis, maybe sometimes, you know, every three years, uh, your commission uh, staff puts together the consolidated grant program and uh, has all the local agencies, uh, you know, submit applications and compete for the funding. So, but you're in competition with the cities and everybody else who needs the same exact things that you do, right? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Montesino. Yeah, and just uh, want to thank the, you know for the hard work that you got, God, man, man, a good presentation of all the projects that you've done, and and you know personally I drive around, but professionally I drive around everywhere in the county, so I'm seeing all these projects, and then in my hemisphere I've seen a lot of projects that yeah you have advanced over over and watch them, and I take credit for all of them. <laughs> and, and the complaints I forward to you know the supervisor, you know. <laughs> That's what you do, um, uh, you know, uh, as a current mayor. But like I said, just uh, kudos to all the hard work that I've uh, seen a lot, of, a, a lot of pavement on the ground and uh, frustrations. Yes. But once it gets done, you know, people are happy with the, the, with the end results. So a lot of them so just want to thank um, your staff. And I would just uh, thank the supervisor also for pushing through the, uh, you know, the pavement plan. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Montesino. Uh, Commissioner Schiffrin. Yes, I also want to thank uh, staff for all the projects that have been moving forward. Uh, it's particularly exciting uh, for me on, to see the so-called uh, drive project. It's going to make a really big difference to uh, moving around in the county. So it's, it's exciting that this, uh, the county was able to get the money to do that. I also wanted to to you know, emphasize uh, an issue that I think you raised about the difficulty the county has uh, <clears throat> due to the storm damage that occurs on rural roads. And you know, the county has had a series of storm damage over the years. Many uh, uh, of them, many of those storms have really created major problems on very small but public rural roads where even with uh, uh, FEMA and state assistance, there's a local share. And just looking at the Board of Supervisors agendas in the last several meetings, it's pretty phenomenal how many millions of dollars the county is having to use out of its local roads fund just to repair storm damage um, in 
road sets serve relatively small numbers of people. And I think that sort of emphasizes the importance of the funding that comes through the commission for the major roads, because the county's resources just aren't available to keep the to you know really respond to the needs of the major roads because they have to provide access to um, the, the the residents in the rural areas. So it's an added burden that I think is not an insignificant one in terms of the kind of um, demands that are made on the limited funds that the uh, local funds that the county has for its um, road projects. So again, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Commissioner Quinn. Sir, I apologize for being late this morning because it took me 78 minutes to get from Aptos to this building. And so that's the preface to my favorite question. As we look at the SoCal Drive improvements, our light synchronization, Robertson intersection, and reversible lanes part of the equation to try to fix this problem? Um, so yes, on the synchronization, uh, like I spoke, we have 22 signals that we're uh, providing modern detection. The other thing really exciting about this project is we're um, installing fiber optic. Um, and it's going to basically, we already have it from Chow Colts to State Park Drive. We're going to tag onto that and we're going from State Park Drive all the way back to the county building. Um, and so, you know, our project goes to uh, the city limits, but we're partnering with the city actually to provide fiber both for them and for the county. And we'll have a true traffic management center here in the county building at the end of this project. And so we'll be able to look at all the signals here in this office, fine tune them. Um, no on the reversible lanes. Um, that's not something that was considered as part of that of that project. And um, and no on the Robertson signal, however, we are actively pursuing that. And that is definitely part of our goals. And uh, we hope it'll come on the heels of this project. So I'm going to whine. Is there a reason we can't look at reversible lanes, particularly through SoCal Village during rush hour times? We've looked at it a little bit. We've looked at the concept, but we haven't done a full analysis of what that would look like. So um, it's something that basically everything's on the table. We'll, we'll definitely continue to consider those types of, you know, traffic management um, mitigations, in, but we just haven't looked at it that closely. I, I will say that uh, actually working together, uh, Director Weiser and I put a placeholder for a study of reversible lanes into the 2045 unconstrained project list. So it's there, certainly, uh, you know, as, a, as an idea, but we need to fund it um, to look at it further. I mean, yep. and as far as a light on Robertson, um, again, yeah, that is absolutely a priority. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I think it's, it's something that I would hope this commission would consider funding uh, when we look at regional projects in the near future. Thank you. Director Brown or Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, considering the kinds of damage that we saw earlier this year, and you wouldn't know it by today's weather, but we're anticipating another really wet season coming up. Um, do we have any anticipation of what kind of damages we might see this coming season and what we might be doing to prepare for it ahead of time? Well, we're definitely preparing. I can tell you, um, we actually just got a comprehensive list of all the work both the road and the drainage crews are doing in the unincorporated areas of our county. And they are busy out there clearing ditches, repairing as many culverts as we can. You know, we do expect a wet winter with El Nino and so forth. Um, we we expect it, We uh, but we hope that we don't get it. Um, we've had enough water for the last year. Um, you can't predict exactly where where these storms are going to hit and what type of damage they're going to cause. I mean, we've seen storms. We have microclimates all over Santa Cruz County throughout throughout the mountains, and we've seen storms park themselves just over one region, like say the Eureka Canyon region, 2009, just got hammered. Nowhere else in the county got hit, and so you can't really expect where these where these things are going to hit our county. But um, we're definitely preparing for it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, as the county supervisor representing Santa Rosa Valley, I thought I'd seen it all until the last atmospheric river storm. Uh, and uh, what you've done is phenomenal and to try to get to it as quickly as possible. And first and foremost, I want to thank the staff and the uh, Public Works Department and all the city agencies who've cooperated in this for um, for putting this together to serve as many people, as many motorists as we can. Um, 
I, I also want to say thank you to the voters of Santa Cruz County. You can't forget that. Measure D passed by more than two thirds of the vote. Uh, it uh, made us a self-help county, which helped us get grants. Um, it, it just was, uh, it, it just kind of stacked up that it helped us more than just that vote. Uh, and also SB1 that was uh, authored by uh, Senator Jim Bell of Santa Clara County that passed in the state, that has helped too. Um, and, you know, Caltrans has been very cooperative. When you have a highway, a highway nine be main street of San Lorenzo Valley, it kind of complicates things, but when it doesn't so much when you have a cooperation from the state that we have received too. So I just want to say thank you to that. Um, I think more than as much as anything else that we get as uh, county supervisors in the rural areas, especially, and uh, probably in the city, uh, everybody wants to have their pothole fixed in front of their property yesterday. And uh, the, the amount of work that needs to be done is enormous, but you are getting to it as quickly as possible. And, uh, and really, uh, in, integrating what is are the needs of today for more uh, bike and pedestrian uh, transportation modes. Uh, it's really impressive of what you've done. And I just want to say thank you to all. Um, we're doing as much as we can as a county and as I know the cities are too, uh, but uh, what you've done and how you've mapped it out and what where you think are the primary projects uh, is really impressive. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, uh, Mr. Well, Hernandez. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, some of the staff at Public Works CDI for all the work they're doing. You know, um, a lot of our rural roads, uh, especially in South County, not only serve, uh, you know, people, uh, a lot of, you know, our city, for example, has 57,000 people, but just within our rural area in South County, we have, we serve 35,000 residents out there in that area throughout the throughout the rural area in South County. So we also serve a lot of people, not just a small amount of people, but uh, we also have a, a big economic impact that, that through those roads that goes through there. There's a lot of agriculture uh, that, that, that really um, serves a, a economic impact in our community for our county, not just, not just uh, South County, but for the entire county. Uh, it provides jobs, tax base, uh, so those rural roads are really important to our local economy as well. Uh, and so I just really want to thank you that, that you're providing the attention to these rural roads that have been, you know, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, forgotten in the past. So thank you for all the work that you guys are doing. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. And I have just a few questions for you. Um, this is Director Reisner. Uh, so you, you showed us that terrifying graph of the uh, declining pavement condition index. Uh, I had 48 burned into my mind as the current pavement condition index. Is it, in fact, 41 as was predicted today? Uh, or what's the, what are the latest? Well, so this year we're due for our next pavement update. And so we're going to be busy uh, doing that this year. And I anticipate that we'll be able to present to that to your board in 24. Um, and so I hate to predict exactly, you know, where we're at right now. Um, I do expect it would be less than 48 based on the science we did five years ago and the work that we've done to date. Um, but I'm hoping we attenuated the decline, you know, better than what we anticipated. Gotcha. So we'll see. Okay. Yeah. Fing fing fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, and then you, you did talk about all the work uh, that you're doing to repair the storm damage sites. Maybe you didn't really mention how what we're doing or our approach to repairing the damage after these last storms is different than uh, what we did in, you know, to respond to the 2016, 17 storms. Could you touch on that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Um, this year, we were fortunate that we got approvals to move forward um, a uh, repairing these as emergency projects. Um, and that is very different in contrast with 2017. In 2017, we were literally only allowed by the by the state and federal funding agencies to pur pursue six significant projects um, during that summer. That's why it took us so long to get all the other ones had to do the full linear uh, environmental process. They take like several years to develop, you know, and with other, over 200 sites, it takes many years to recover from an event like that. This year, we got approvals, both from Caltrans. I think just, you know, the, the impact 
statewide was so great. It was recognized both by Caltrans and the Federal Highway Administration that if they don't allow us just to really repair these now, that we're going to be in a world of hurt. Our state will be moving forward. So we got approvals to do that. And we have been aggressively pursuing that. And I cannot tell you how much work is going on out there. And you don't see it down here, you know, it, by the ocean, but the impacts up in the hills are real. They're great. Um, these roads connect our communities and it's how people get to and from school and work and, you know, how we get services out to them. Um, and so we're really, really busy out there. Uh, and that's why I said we've completed like nearly 40 projects and we have over 30 in construction today. And so it's, those numbers are huge. I've never seen anything like that in my time here at the county. Yeah, it, it's really amazing. And thank you, of course, to our state and federal partners uh, for, for helping us move forward quickly with those emergency permits. Um, but the, the downside to this, though, is that we've got to borrow the money until we get reimbursement from FEMA and Cal OES. Is that correct? Yeah, there are definitely real cash flow impacts right. um, to doing it the way we're doing it. Um, but we are, again, working with both our state and federal partners to get reimbursed as quickly as possible. It's a frustrating process, uh, but our team's committed to doing it. Um, and we have to get this money. I mean, we we our road fund won't survive without, without the reimbursements. I mean, I, I think that... It, it, there's a very strong argument that we have to do these repair work too, or otherwise we're going to fall behind. I mean, as you absolutely said, we're still doing the 2016, 17 repairs and yeah. uh, could have a wet winter ahead. Um, all right. I, you know, I really also appreciate the partnership looking at every time we do a resurfacing project, improving the facilities for bikes and pedestrians as well, um, both on Portola drive and Thurber drive uh, in my own district. We accomplished some great projects recently uh, with, with better green bike lanes going in. Um, it, but we don't have a vision zero adopted for the county yet, right? Is that, uh, I believe we're moving forward with that soon though. So we became, uh, the county became a vision zero agency um, in August 22. And just right on the heels of that, we submitted an application to the federal government for their safe routes uh, for all um, program, which is through the, the Joe Biden, IJL, you know, the, the, the infrastructure um, bill that went through. And uh, we were awarded, uh, I think, nearly $800,000 to create a Vision Zero Action Plan. So we are just uh, in the final stages of negotiating the contract with the federal government. And we plan to bring that to our board here in the next month or so uh, for approval with an RFP to get a consultant on board. And I will say that's in partnership with the city of Watsonville and the city of Scotts Valley. Um, and we're really looking forward to kicking that off. It's going to be about a two-year process. Um, but yes, it will bring a Vision Zero action plan to our county. All right, looking forward to seeing that. Um, and then finally, um, yeah, I think the, the project on SoCal Drive is really uh, going to be transformative. Uh, very excited. It's definitely laying the, uh, you know, we're literally building the infrastructure framework that we need, I think, ultimately to build also then the housing that we need in our community. Um, and could you talk a little bit about the, you know, how much does one of those smart lights cost? Uh, it was great that we're doing it on the section of SoCal Drive that we're repairing, but I mean, ultimately, wouldn't it be better or, or good to, for us to work with the cities who are represented here uh, to put in more of those smart lights so that the bus can, you know, continue to do the, you know, get get through those lights faster, no matter whether they're in the unincorporated area or one of the cities? Sure. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I don't have an exact estimate for you. And I think a lot of it really has to do with what the existing infrastructure is uh, and, at the signals. And so that's what it's just painstaking work to go evaluate every single one of those intersections, look to see what, you know, controllers we had out there and what the current detection systems are. And so I, the, the costs actually do vary quite a bit from intersection to intersection based on each one. Um, you know, but it's a considerable investment. I mean, I just don't have any exact numbers. I'd be happy to report back to you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Well, of course, we also uh, look forward to the tour of the traffic uh, management room that once you get that set up here in the next few years. Um, all right. If there's no further questions from the commission, any member of the public wish to comment on this item? No one here in chambers. Is there anyone online? I see a few hands. We'll begin with Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian from uh, Trail Now. Uh, Steve, great work. Thank you. Uh, where our roads, we need them fixed. <laughs> so very much appreciate your work. Um, you know, the, the 2016 Measure D obviously is is a gangbusters for helping our community. And just to remind you and the commission is, you know, when that first came out, uh, the language had a lot of money going towards um, 
not in the direction we wanted it. So we came out as a pack against it. And then Zach Friend and Don Lane adjusted the language and uh, we supported and our supporters gave most of the funds to make that uh, measure D pass. Um, question for you is metrics. Do you do any metrics to see how accurate you are on your estimates? Um, you know, uh, you know, and do you compare that to other ones like the city, like the city of Santa Cruz, how good they're doing? I can tell you on segment 7B, uh, which is the trail, we expect it to be a couple million over budget and over scheduled. So like to hear more about metrics. And then the Green Valley uh, that you showed, um, definitely support moving forward with improving that road. And the $2 million, you know, easily can be found under segment nine, where our community is uh, wasting a lot of money building the trail next to the tracks um, and actually cutting down a lot, clear cutting hundreds of uh, heritage trees. So that could be a fun source if we got smart on that. And then finally, roundabouts. Uh, I'd like to hear, you know, why aren't we looking at more roundabouts in the way of utilizing um, those because they're more efficient than just regular lights. Again, thanks again for your work. Over. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Next up, we'll hear from Metro Director Rebecca Downing. Rebecca? Okay. Go ahead. There, can you hear me? We can. Great. Good morning. Uh, I have a quick question for Steve about the SoCal Drive project. Uh, the current speed limit uh, is 35 on SoCal Drive between Aegis and the entrance to SoCal Village. But many people exceed this um, because, like you mentioned, it's Highway 2. Uh, once the safety measures are installed, will the speed limit change in this area? That was my question. Thanks. Thank you, Director Downing. I will take all public comments and then return for some questions. Uh, number ending in 205. Go ahead. They don't have their hand up. Oh, sorry. Uh, all right, so we don't have any more hands? No. Nope. All right. No, we do not. Uh, oh, okay. there we go. We just got one race. Uh, Disappeared. Don't have any hands. All right. Um, all right, Fort Zoom host. Thank you. This is Matt Farrell. I'm um, here to speak in support of all the hard work that County Public Works has done. Uh, and also to thank Supervisor McPherson and for, former Supervisor John Leopold for their leadership at the Board of Supervisors in 2016 to get Measure D on the ballot. Without that, as Supervisor McPherson said, we wouldn't have qualified as a self-help county, which would which has an impact on all the different efforts in transportation that our region works on. And um, I think maintaining these facilities across the board is critical to our community's quality of life. And uh, I know personally, having worked in transportation for 30 years that these projects are marathon efforts. They're not sprints. So thank you again for all your work. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. All right, seeing no further hands, um, Director Wiesner, I wonder if you could answer a couple of questions that were raised. The first about the speed limit on SoCal Drive, will that change? Um, yeah, so um, the speed limit is not uh, not slated to change as a result of this project. However, um, you know, the county is responsible where it has a you know, speed limit set to do speed surveys once every seven, seven to 10 years. Um, we have a regular process we go through and it involves radaring and, you know, uh, you know, coming up with the 85th percentile. There's a legal process that we go through to set speed limits. And SoCal Drive won't be treated any differently from any other road. And certainly if we see an uptick in speeds and we have a reason to go back out there and, and, and do a speed survey earlier than not, we would do that as well. Okay, thank you. And then the other question, uh, roundabouts, is there any place where we're looking at 
with those. I know they can be intensive as far as the amount of space they use. Yeah, it's. I mean, we're really excited to try and install as many roundabouts as we can um, where we have opportunities. And, you know, we see like Portola Drive potentially an opportunity where there's a currently existing four-way stops and so forth. Um, the biggest constraints on roundabout is right away is like really getting the geometry that you need to put them in and then they're expensive. Um, but we're very much so in favor of roundabouts and we're looking at areas of the county where we can put them in. I think the last one we did was uh, the Twin Lakes area uh, down there by the harbor. Um, and we had done one previously uh, in the Esplanade area of Rio del Mar. Um, but we're looking for opportunities for sure to put in roundabouts. Great, thank you. Um, very happy. Want to make a public comment? We'll reopen that. Hey, Dred. Yeah, of course. If you could just make sure to speak into the mic, sir, we'd love to hear everything you say. Yeah. Is it is it on? Try pushing the little gray button. There's a little button right here. On the back of the, Down on the, at base. the base. That button. There, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I just like to thank you, Steve, and the group here uh, and the board uh, to uh, allow me to just say couple of comments on uh, as I have worked with Steve in past on uh, some erosion issues and I really appreciate what county has done and uh, to try to help little guys like me and uh, we that little work and there is a bit more needed so I just like to get some support from commission and from public works if uh, we can to look a little down the stream on some of those erosion projects that like on my property has been severely eroded. And I know with highway widening, and I understand it's not all in their hands. However, I'm just looking for support that we look just a little bit further from discharge or exit ramp on a highway one. And also SoCal Drive to where I am greatly affected, have had several landslides. Uh, the county has uh, done uh, some remedy to it, try to uh, create a slow the flow down and uh, reinforce the banks a little bit, but just in a, a, a small section of it. And it really needs to be carried out to its discharge, which is into Valencia Creek. Um, and uh, so, if possible, if you can somehow look at that section as you guys negotiate and work with a state cow trans to complete that project as next step is now uh, going to be from uh, State Parks Drive to uh, Freedom Boulevard. And that's going to add even more erosion because a lot more area is going to be surfaced and um, it's all just discharged and let go on a private property, in this case, my property. And uh, it has a created a landslide in particularly this last year was huge. And now I'm at the remedy of fixing it. Um, so I like to know if Steve somehow can uh, try to push that a little forward. I really appreciate your effort. I'm just looking for help because I alone cannot sustain maintaining the waterways for a, uh, uh, it's not, not just a state water, but it's a whole county, a whole basin drains into it and it's a discharge. And it's kind of a long story. Don't want to bore you all how it all started and how it all got there. But thank you, sir. Yes, we will certainly uh, follow up with you after the meeting um, and see you know, how really we can address it. this issue. Thank you for coming to speak okay, today. So Steve, thank you. All right. Anyone else uh, wishing to, to make a comment? All right. Then I'm going to close public comment. Um, return to the commission. No action is necessary. This was just to receive a presentation. So thank you, Mr. Carlson. Thank Mr. you, Wiesner, for the excellent presentation today. Yes. Um, and now we'll proceed with item 19, Highway 1 construction update. This is an oral report from our senior transportation engineer, Sarah Christensen and Junior Transportation Engineer, Brian Zamora. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. I'm Sarah Christensen. I've been managing the highway program for many years now, and um, I'd like to give a proper introduction to Brian Zamora, who um, joined us back in 2019 as a student intern. Um, he got his degree in 2021 and joined us full-time as a Junior Transportation Engineer. And um, he has been working on the branch line quite a bit, 
but is now getting more involved with Highway 1. And um, he's going to give today's construction update for the Phase 1 project. So I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Thank you, Sarah. So this is... <laughs> go. Thank you, Sarah. So yeah, as Sarah mentioned, I've been with the RTC for around four years. Started as an intern. Uh, I was born and raised in Watsonville. And I got my degree from San Jose State and been working with the RTC mostly on um, rail preservation and maintenance and getting involved in the highway project as of recent. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for the future and to continue my career. Uh, so now we're going to get into the Highway 1 construction update. Um, next slide, please. On today's update, we're going to cover Highway 1 construction. We're going to cover Phase 1, 41st Avenue to SoCal, Phase 2 State Park to Bay Porter, cover a little bit on our public outreach plan, and we'll have time for questions and discussion at the end. Next slide, please. So getting started. So getting started, or is retaining wall number two. Retaining wall number two is located on the northbound side of the of Highway One, next to Rodell Gulch. Um, retaining wall number two is one of the more complex retaining walls we have at the, in the project, as it is a soldier pile soldier pile retaining wall. Um, it derives its name from the piles you see on screen being driven vertically into the embankment. Um, as you can see now, they're not just standing piles there, as the contractor has added the concrete lagging. The uh, lagging, which are precast concrete panels. Um, in the first picture, you could see the outside edge of the retaining wall. This is the retaining wall facing towards Rodel Gulch. And in the two sec the second and the third picture, you could see the process in which the contractor takes to uh, install the lagging. Next slide, please. Moving on to retaining wall number five. Um, retaining wall number five is also located in the northbound side of the highway. Um, it differs from retaining wall number two as it is a reinforced concrete retaining wall. As you can see, the contractor has finished most of the retaining wall and has began backfilling up to the retaining wall and grading to match existing roadway levels. Right, please. Moving on to the pedestrian overcrossing retaining wall slash approaches. These approaches are being currently built on the northbound and southbound sides of the highway. Um, these approaches are going to be the ramps that connect to the future bridge structure that travels over Highway 1. In the first picture, you could see the rebar and form liners being set up for the concrete to be poured. And in the second picture, you could see the approach on the southbound side of the highway, which has had its foundation poured. And as of now, the northbound approach has also had its foundation poured in the port and the contractor continues to make progress there. Slide, please. So moving on to the pedestrian overcrossing, uh, the pedestrian, the bicyclist and pedestrian overcrossing um, is a major element of this project. Um, this, in the screen, you can see medium bent five, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen if you use a highway frequently. Um, in the first picture, you can see the median, uh, the bent being installed into its foundation and getting prepped for the concrete to be poured. And in the second picture, you can see the same bent but encapsulated uh, in a casing. These casings are used to mold the concrete and are removed after the concrete cures, which form the concrete piles. Next slide, please. So a little bit more of the pedestrian overcrossing. On screen, you can see Bent 2, which is located near SoCal Creek uh, Water District and along the SoCal Avenue frontage road. Um, in the picture, you can see pile to being installed into its foundation, getting prepped for the concrete to be poured. As of now, um, vents two and five have been completed, and it's, it's expected that vents three, four, and six and seven will be poured in the coming weeks. And if not, some of them are being poured at this moment. Um, we also, a quick little note, we wanna let the public know that there's a lot of traffic control going around SoCal Avenue. Just to be safe, watch their speeds, their surroundings. Um, Safety is our number one priority. We just want to reduce the risk of injury or any accidents. Slide, please. Now I'll hand you over to my colleague, Sarah, for a uh, high one schedule update. Thanks, Brian. Um, so the phase one project started early this year. Uh, major construction activities were anticipating it to be complete in 2025. 
uh, dependent on weather, um, of course. Um, if you could scroll down a tiny bit, Yesenia. The phase two project um, was awarded in June um, and we've been working with the contractor and Caltrans to schedule some of the major activities. Um, and uh, it sounds like there's gonna be some closures and minor construction kind of preparation work uh, this year, but the majority of the major construction is going to uh, likely begin in March of 2024. So can you go to the next slide? Speaking of um, public outreach and uh, major construction, uh, the phase two project includes the sort of replacement of the Capitola Avenue overcrossing. This has been in the works for a long time, so this should not be news to you, but the Capitola Avenue will be closed for several months. Um, and I have a map showing the detour route. Uh, this is not anticipated until 2024. Uh, and so we plan to do a very robust outreach process uh, to get the word out about this prior to the demolition of that bridge. What we can expect later this month is a little bit of pre-work. There's a PG&E overhead line that needs to be relocated. Um, that's going to require full closure of Highway 1 at night. Uh, so we're looking at that at the end of this month. We're also looking at coordinating that full closure with the full closure needed for the Phase 1 project, um, which is to erect some of the formwork for the Chanticleer pedestrian overcrossing. So that um, we're definitely, um, the two projects are talking. It's the same contractor, so it's easy to coordinate. Um, and you could see a little snapshot of the Capitola Avenue uh, rendering when it will be complete. As you're aware, we've been doing quite a bit of regional outreach. We coordinate quite a bit with county um, regarding the buffered bike lane multimodal project that they have under development that just started construction uh, to make sure that we don't have any overlapping closures and um, we wanna reduce the impacts of the traveling public as best as we can. And when we do anticipate impacts, we wanna do a very robust outreach effort. Uh, an exciting new development on this project is that Caltrans um, has on their website a uh, live feed of the Chanticleer Avenue pedestrian overcrossing construction. So um, this presentation is on our website. Um, and if you click the link down at the right corner, that will take you to a live stream of uh, bridge construction. So that's exciting. I think that's all we have. Right. Yep. That concludes our staff report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Other questions or comments from commissioners? Excuse me if um, I was out for a minute. Will the uh, pedestrian bike overcrossing be done before the, the highway portion of the project's done? And if so, can it be used prior to that being completed? Typically, the Bridges are on the what we call the critical path. So it's not anticipated that it's going to be done, you know, um, significantly earlier than the rest of the project. If it is done um, prior, you know, it could start being used. Um, it all depends on the contractor's schedule and how they're preparing to do the work. So um, that's a possibility. But Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Um, did I see the table correctly that phase two of the highway project would expect to be completed sometime in 2026. Correct. About, yeah, about a year later than um, the phase one. Okay, right, thanks. Other questions? All right, seeing none, anyone in the public wish to comment on this item? Anyone here in chambers? No. Nope. Uh, all right, we have one question, one hand raised online. Mr. Peoples, go ahead. Hi, it's Brian People's Trail. Now, we support widening highway because it's about uh, not necessarily vehicle miles traveled. That's the old metric. That's a negative metric. And actually, AMBAG is looking at a new metric. So it's called people miles travel. And, you know, and we need to open all three corridors, the highway corridor, SoCal, and the coastal trail as soon as possible. We included a comment on this subject and it's included in the attachments. And what the frustration is, is that 
Executive Director Guy Preston had recommended years ago that we move forward with opening the coastal trail in a timely, cost-effective, and eco-friendly manner when he presented the rail banking recommendation. And if we had moved forward with that, there would have been an alternative. Dr. Quinn probably would have been on time because he could have ridden his bike. So the frustration with our is that the community is with um, not looking at what is really needed to open the corridor to support this highway widening. So um, again, I, I won't be I, I thank very much Caltrans, Sarah, for the great work you guys are doing on widening the highway. But the people are really frustrated because traffic is so bad and it's just going to get worse. And I feel real bad for that mother who has to take her kids to uh, the school and child care. And then she has to go to work and she's late. just like Dr. Quinn was late today. And that's going to be for 10 years. So there's a lot of frustration that we're not looking at the metrics of people miles travel. And we need to open all three corridors and allow people to get going where they need to get to in a timely manner. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Anyone else online? All right, seeing none, I'll close public comment and return it to the commission. This is just a uh, receiving a report. I don't think any action is required. Seeing no further comments, thank you very much to both of you for the excellent report. The commission will now move into closed session. Council, is there any reportable action expected out of closed session? Uh, we we do anticipate the likelihood of a reportable action today. Okay, thank you. And uh, we'll move into closed session. I believe we'll just stay in place for commissioners. Uh, thank you. Okay. session and county council do we have any reportable actions out of closed session uh, thank you uh, chair koenig the commission met in closed session and provided direction to their real property negotiators to finalize the purchase and sale agreement for the properties at 7994 and 7996 ocal in the amount of uh, two million dollars which is the amount the commission had previously approved and with the indemnification language that has been identified in the addendum to that um, that purchase and sale agreement. And that action by the commission was by unanimous vote of the commission. All right. Thank you very much for that report. That concludes our meeting today. Meeting adjourned.